Hey everyone, this is my second video on coherence. The previous episode was mostly about temporal coherence and how it's directly related to the spectral properties of light. If you haven't seen it, it might be a good idea to watch that one first, because the current video is really a sequel of part one. Today I will mainly talk about spatial coherence, how it comes about and what it means for the properties of light. And I will also take a few sidetracks. Now I found I could not fit all the sidetracks into this video, so good news for those of you who like sequels. There will be a part 3. I live in Hilversum, the Netherlands, and close to my home there is this long rectangular pond that is named after Hendrik Anton Lorentz, in my opinion one of the greatest Dutch scientists ever. And this pond is ideal to demonstrate real life spatial coherence. The pond has a fountain in it, which consists of three water jets that generate a lot of splashes. And so in the vicinity of the fountain, every point on the surface moves rather chaotically. However, if we move away from the actual splash zone, we observe that the waves gradually start moving in the same direction, away from the source, and become ever more organized. Shh, shh, go away. If we consider a small enough part of the wavefront, we observe that the waves are almost linear, which means that all points in the direction transverse to wave propagation move in unison or in sync. And so if we consider a small enough area of the wavefront, we can say that the waves have gradually become spatially coherent. Now, if you look at the spacing between the waves, you'll still observe that the frequency of the waves changes with time in the direction of wave propagation. And this is related to temporal coherence, a phenomenon that was covered in the previous video. So what you observe in the general sense is that the region of spatial coherence gradually expands when the waves move further away from the sources. Now, although quite illustrative, this pond is not ideal as a model, especially with birds and the wind contributing to the total wave pattern. So let me take you to the more controlled environment of numerical simulation. The simulation that I'm about to show you was made by Niels Berklund, who runs a YouTube channel in his name. And on his channel he regularly posts visualizations of all kinds of physical phenomena, from chemical reactions to laser solving mazes. And he very kindly accepted the challenge to do this wave simulation, which allows us to look in more detail how waves develop in time. Let's go to the start of the simulation. It involves 15 randomly positioned wave sources that each emit a longitudinal wave in one long burst. The sources have a slightly different emission frequency and start at a random phase. And as you can see, they emit waves in all directions. And what we observe is how relatively close to the sources, the wave patterns are quite chaotic, a bit like in the pond. But as the waves move further away, from the disorder, we see that things settle down pretty quickly. And again, if we consider only part of the wavefront, we can actually see how spatial coherence grows with distance. But there's more. We can identify these areas where the waves are relatively strong. These are separated by what appear to be boundaries where the amplitude is low due to destructive interference. Now, for the casual observer, it may seem that the waves and the wave energy is non-uniformly distributed in space, but that is actually not the case, because the simulation basically only highlights potential energy and not so much the kinetic energy in the waves. But what we do observe is that the waves from apparently random emitting sources result in a wave pattern that gradually becomes spatially coherent some distance further away. It also illustrates nicely the most important aspects of temporal and spatial decoherence. But why do waves seem to add up to a fairly regular pattern when they move away from the sources? Well, one important aspect is that when they move further away, the wave propagation directions of the different sources are lining up. And what you should realize is that when waves of the same frequency but with a different phase are exactly lined up, they will result in one single regular wave of the same frequency. And so all the initial chaos related to just phase differences from the various wave sources gradually disappears when we move further away. Now in this case, the linear addition of individual waves will never show a 100% regular pattern because the sources all emit at a different frequency. And so phase relationships are not constant in time and space. 
and that is why we observe these areas of decoherence in both the direction of propagation as well as in the transverse direction. Let's see if we can understand quantitatively how spatial coherence in waves is related to geometry. Spatial coherence of waves in 3D space, like for example light, can be characterized by an area of coherence and it's interesting to see what defines this area. I'll just start by giving you a formula. You see that the coherence area is proportional to the distance from the source squared and the wavelength squared and inversely proportional to the diameter of the source squared. I should add that this is a simplification which only applies if the distance r is much larger than the size of the emitter. Now there's actually quite a lot to it if you want to derive this formula properly in the case of light, which I don't want to do. However, I think it's good to give you some general insight into this formula. Imagine we have a source in the shape of a flat round disk emitting waves. And let's for now consider only those waves arriving from the extreme outside of this source which arrive on a surface located somewhat further away. Now this surface is perpendicular to the axis pointing in the direction of the source and we observe that these waves are in phase on the axis. If we move some distance in the y direction away from the central axis, the waves will gradually get out of phase more and more until they are completely out of phase. Now if we define y as the distance over which the phase shift between these two waves is lower than an acceptable value, let's say for example 60 degrees of phase shift, we find that the distance y is proportional to the wavelength. So the shorter the wavelength, the smaller this distance y. And this relationship between y and the wavelength is actually a linear one. Now the same kind of relationship holds for the distance from the source. The longer the distance between source and area, the larger the value of y within which waves will still be considered to be in phase. However, for the size of the emitter, it's exactly the opposite. So the smaller the distance between the outer boundaries of the emitter, the larger the value of y. And so we can summarize that the distance y is linearly proportional to the wavelength and the distance from the source and is inversely proportional to the size of the emitter. And that means that the area of coherence, which is defined by y as the radius of a circle, is proportional to y squared. Now, if you compare this result with the formula I showed you, you may notice there is this detail which is a bit out of place, and that is the 1 over pi. And this is actually a proportionality factor that arises if we derive this formula in a mathematically more rigorous way, based on the exact geometric configuration of a round source and our coherence requirements. Now, as stated, this is a somewhat simplified representation, but nevertheless the resulting formula is actually quite useful. So let's calculate the area of coherence for the Sun using this formula. I must remark that technically speaking on Earth the constraint between the distance and the size is not truly satisfied. You should also keep in mind that the Sun is spectrally very broad, so we have to choose a wavelength for which to do the calculation. But when we fill in the values for the diameter of the Sun, the distance between the Sun and Earth and choose a value for lambda in the center of the visible spectrum, say 500 nanometers, we arrive at an area of coherence of almost 900 square microns, which is equivalent to the area with a diameter of 34 microns. And this area is comparable to the cross section of a human hair. Of course, this only works if there are no clouds in the sky, because in that case the area of coherence will definitely be smaller. And since wavelength is a parameter for blue light with a somewhat shorter wavelength, the area of coherence will be somewhat smaller, and for red light it will be somewhat larger. It's interesting to note that when Thomas Young wrote his paper about the theory of light and colors in 1801, he did of course not have a laser or any really bright light sources available other than the sun, and so Young was more or less forced to use sunlight for his experiment. From what I've read on the internet, he used a mirror to direct the sunlight through a tiny pinhole into a darkened room to create a bright beam of light. And with the knowledge you have just acquired about the area of coherence of the sun, I think it should be fairly obvious to you what the function of the pinhole is. It's intended to make all the light entering the room spatially coherent. When I try to confirm that this is how he actually did it in the original paper, 
I couldn't find any reference to a mirror or an aperture in the window, or to a double slit for that matter. Yes, that's correct. Thomas Young's famous double slit experiment actually did not involve a double slit configuration. Instead, he placed a thin card in the beam that split it in half, which caused the diffraction pattern. And this is how he could observe the separation of light into different colors. Even a few years later in his 1804 paper on the same subject, there is no reference to a double slit configuration anywhere. However, six years after the original experiment, Young published two books that contained a large collection of lectures. And in volume one, he did actually mention a configuration resembling a double slit. The reason why I think this is interesting is because it illustrates how we communicate about signs. We don't necessarily communicate facts, most of the time we communicate metaphors that represent the essence of an experiment and not necessarily the details of the actual configuration. So somewhere in history somebody decided to name it Thomas Young's double slit experiment and this then became synonymous with the phenomenon observed. Now don't get me wrong. There is nothing like a good metaphor to explain difficult concepts to an audience of non-experts. However, extending the use of metaphors beyond what they're intended for can become pretty confusing. Take the double slit experiment for single electrons instead of photons. Here are a few examples of how that experiment is depicted. See if you can spot the confusing aspect. It's not the cougar here, which might very well be a metaphor for something else too, who knows. No, the confusing aspect is that all these visuals show narrow slits with a very substantial distance between them, which makes the experiment intrinsically mysterious, because how can a particle small enough to pass through a narrow slit pass through two widely spaced slits at the same time? However, if we refer to the original experiment performed at Hitachi, the interference was actually created by using an electron biprism, and this device basically consists of an extremely thin charged wire with a thickness much smaller than a micron. So when you look at this configuration, the interference effect suddenly becomes much less mysterious because it's basically about how the electron interacts with an object small enough as to demonstrate that the electron has wave properties. And so the metaphor of the double slit and the way it's presented doesn't necessarily help people understand. If anything, it just adds to the confusion. Ah well, all of this doesn't change the fact that actual double slits do a good job in demonstrating the effect that Thomas Young observed. So let's do a true double slit experiment that illustrates the effect of spatial coherence in light. And for this demonstration we'll use white light. So. Here are two slits etched in a layer of chromium on a glass slide, and we are looking at them under a microscope. They're actually quite small, about 300 microns long and 5 microns wide. Why so small? Well, because we really want to bring out the colors and the interference here in a lot of detail. I'll place a link to another video in the description about how you can record this type of images. We'll start out by looking at how the light through the slits develop when the area of coherence is much smaller than the dimensions of the current double slit configuration. Basically this can be achieved by placing a white LED very near to the slits. Now, if we now move away from the slits, we'll observe how the light passing the slits is diffracted and how this results in two blurry blobs that merge without any noticeable interference. And this is because the light does not contain any phase relationships on points in the slit area. So this is not particularly fascinating, right? Now let's replace the close by positioned LED with a light source that produces spatially coherent light. And this means that the area of coherence is much larger than the total area of the two slits. And so in this case, there is a fixed phase relationship for every wavelength at every point on the slits. And look what happens now if we do the same experiment. Once the light from the two beams starts to overlap, we observe this fascinating pattern of colored lines developing because of the different wavelengths going in and out of phase. What we observe in this pattern is actually temporal decoherence. In the center of the pattern all the wavelengths are in phase with each other because the distance to the two slits is equal for every point on that line. But as we move away from the center every wavelength has its own 
interference periodicity. And so the phase differences between the light originating from two different slits will be different for every wavelength. So this is the reason why you need spatial coherence to do a proper double slit experiment. It's pretty cool, huh? You want to see something even cooler? Well, here I've got a bunch of slits on which we can do the famous bunch of slits experiment. Together, these can actually perform a little math operation for us. They can do a Fourier transform on the temporal signal of the light passing the area of the slits. And here you see how the transformation develops in space as we move away from the grating. It results in a spectrum showing all the frequencies present in the LED used for the experiment. In other words, it's a microscopically small spectrometer in one pattern. Previously, we calculated the area of coherence for light from the sun and found that the area is pretty small in the visible range. But of course, for stars a bit further away, we can do the same thing. That is, if we know their size and distance, and that is for example the case for this particular star here in the Scorpio constellation. The star is called Antares, after the Greek god of war, and indeed Antares is not a friendly little neighborhood star. Depending on which source you consult, Antares is about 6 to 800 times larger than our sun. And I mean larger in diameter. If we were to place this big boy in our own solar system, its physical boundaries would extend beyond the orbit of the planet Mars. It's a monster, but fortunately for us, it's also 550 light years away from Earth. Now, if we do the same calculation for the area of coherence of light from Antares on Earth, we find a value of about 2.3 square meters. Now, I want you to let this sink in for a second. Here we have an object so massive, it's beyond human comprehension, which emits unimaginable amounts of random emissions every second. Yet by the time the radiation arrives on Earth, the sum of these individual contributions yields a field that is as good as uniform within an area of several square meters. And you can actually measure this with methods similar to the double slit experiment. Of course, as for the temporal field properties, it still contains a lot of frequencies since the light emitted by Antares is spectrally also very broad. But just think about how you could explain, for example, the phase relationship from a corpuscular perspective on light. Also keep in mind, Antares is a huge star relatively close by. So smaller, further away stars can easily have an area of coherence the size of a square kilometer. As you may have noticed, I focused on the wave behavior of light so far, in this video but also in the previous one. And if you want, you can consider this a classical perspective. In the previous video I made friends for life with the quantum mechanics community by stating that the properties of light arise purely from wave behavior. And as much as I would like to elaborate on this a bit further, I don't think it's a good idea to do that near the end of a video that is already pretty long. By the way, apart from the use of the word photon in video part 1, I didn't make a single reference to quantum mechanics, because I think it's safe to say I don't understand quantum mechanics. I did take courses on the subject at university and I did pass the exams without a problem, but somehow it never made sense to me. I guess I just wasn't smart enough. There was one thing that struck me during the discussion and that was that at some fundamental level we do not seem to agree on what exactly we mean with the word light. If you'd ask someone like me with a classical mindset to describe light, that person would probably mainly refer to the electromagnetic phenomenon. So I would say something like, well, we have a source that emits light, and this light propagates in space, is scattered, diffracted, reflected, whatever, and it's then detected or absorbed, for example, in your eye. And from this perspective, I'm referring to the electromagnetic radiation as light. However, if you'd ask the same question, to someone deeply involved in quantum mechanics, the emphasis would not be on the radiation aspect. It would likely be more on the emission and absorption processes and how these involve the transfer of discrete energy packages. So I guess from the viewpoint of someone in quantum mechanics, double slit experiments are only marginally interesting at best. They would argue that the quantized interaction between radiation and matter is proof that 
the radiation or the field itself must also be quantized. And that this proof is in many experiments, including the photoelectric effect and Compton scattering. Now just to be clear, I'm not questioning the quantized nature of the interaction between radiation and matter. But do these experiments truly show that the radiation, which I refer to as light, is quantized into discrete packages of energy? Or do they merely demonstrate that the interaction of electromagnetic radiation with all matter is fundamentally probabilistic? I have a feeling that we have plenty to talk about in part 3, and maybe we can even discover a suitable common metaphor. <laughs>